Morning, my name's Andy Young and I'm one of the lecturers down at Unitech in Auckland, New Zealand. And I like to produce uh, workshop videos uh, primarily for my students uh, and I try to cover uh, tasks and activities that we do uh, during the practical lessons and also a lot of stuff that we don't get time to do during the practicals. And uh, one of the uh, tools that we use during the class is uh, an oscilloscope when we're doing the uh, fuel injection and ignition systems on the vehicles. And oscilloscopes, you know, 20 years ago or so, were really out of the reach of, of most people's um, budget, really. Uh, they're a pretty technical piece of equipment, and usually only, um, you know, franchise dealers and so on would really have their hands on that kind of kit, uh, for car repairs, that is. But nowadays, you can go online, you can buy, uh, you know, pretty cheap, oscilloscope, a single channel oscilloscope for like a hundred bucks. It's a standalone unit, you know, it's not uh, an app for your phone or anything like that. I'm sure that that will come at some point, maybe, maybe it's already here. Um, but using an oscilloscope, essentially, the way I describe it to my students, is it's a bit like using a, a TV screen. It's like a live, constant feed of information, where you can see not just what's happening now, but uh, if you set it up right, you can see what you, you know, what you've just what's just been happening, so you can compare results. Um, it gives you a lot more information than a multimeter, uh, or a you know, or using a voltmeter for the, for the, uh, for the test. Um, with a voltmeter, as soon as the display is changed, you've lost the previous history. You don't know what it was. Voltmeters can't really react that well, and they're not all that sensitive. They tend to jump around quite a bit. Whereas an oscilloscope is extremely accurate, and we've got lots of things that we can adjust on there to try and give us uh, a reading where we can interpret that reading uh, and maybe look for very minor uh, defects uh, or anomalies in a particular output signal of a sensor, for example. So before we go on car, I just really want to run through how to use the equipment um, and just a few of its functions. I'm not going to cover everything because it, they, these things are amazing and there's lots of stuff you can do and there's things that even I don't know how to, how to operate. Um, but there's a few things that I do know, and um, <clears throat> I found these things, these units, really, really helpful when it comes to trying to diagnose um, a fault on a car where maybe it's just not quite running properly, or it's a bit hesitant, or it coughs every now and again. Uh, you know, those, those odd little faults that, that you check with the multimeter and you think, well, it, it's within spec, it's all good. Um, quite often, it can be a faulty sensor, which is giving um, a slightly defect reading to the ECU, and that's causing something to happen that you don't want to happen. So without further ado, because I'm very conscious about the length of these videos, and I do my very best to edit them down, um, we will make a start um, on how to use an oscilloscope. Now, um, this one is a reasonably expensive one. I think they're about 500 bucks a pop. I'm not really sure. This is one from work that I've borrowed. Uh, to make this video um, and no doubt it's going to have to go back in the next few days <clears throat> because they're going to need it for sure um, although we've got plenty of them they're going to need this one <clears throat> okay so first of all i'm going to set the unit up in conjunction with a variable output um, transformer essentially this will produce for me between zero volts dc and up to about 15 volts dc and i can use that to generate a, a linear change in the output so i can just turn this dial here and that's going to give us a varying voltage. And we should see that come up on the screen. So we'll just get this set up. Right, to turn the unit on, you just press and hold the on button. <clears throat> okay. So at the moment it's set up for checking a TPS sensor. Now TPS sensors, the new ones, the linear type, do in fact give a signal of um, between zero and five volts output. So this, this really would mimic uh, exactly that. So if we now, um, what are we on? We now just give that a tweak. There we go. So we should see come up on the screen. If I slow that down, so we go into deviation, H is for time. We go on to there, we're at 200 milliseconds at the moment. Let's 
just slow that down to one minute segments and you can see now it's tracking on the roll across the graph and I can drop that down and we can see on there as I increase the voltage we can see it increasing in nice steady increments and back down again and that's really uh, what we would see on a TPS output as we're opening and closing the quadrant on TPS now if we were testing a TPS unit as we turn the quadrant um, we'll be looking for very progressive equal increments in output voltage and if I can see that there look you just see it slowly climbing up now the, vo the voltage output on the TPS maxes out about four and a half volts we're up to about eight volts now but you get the idea of what the unit can do as regards a linear output and you know we can create a sharp spike just by firing it straight up and straight back down again you can see how the voltage tails off so that that would be the setting you could use for checking a TPS unit and hey we may do that later on in the video I might take one off a car so we can actually check a real unit now <clears throat> the main benefit with these units um, is the fact that we can test um, digital signals. Now a digital signal is one that goes on and then off, and on and then off. And um, probably the easiest way to show you that as an example would be something like a flasher relay. Uh, so I'm going to rig up a flasher relay and then we'll see how that comes up on the screen and then we'll talk about what changes the frequency of those pulses. Okay, so I've just rigged up a real simple flasher relay. Now this isn't uh, an electronic flasher relay. This is one of the old school mechanical ones and you'll hear it actuating once it fires up. Now at the moment we've got current flowing to it but it's insufficient to operate the armature inside. We're essentially you know, around about zero volts, there's hardly any current flow, in fact we're 0.01 volts, now, look at that. Now as we bring that up there'll be a threshold where it'll suddenly start to operate. So we bring it up nice and slowly, there we go, look, we've got a voltage now. And you can see on the screen, we'll just, I don't want to go in too, oh, we'll bring it up to about 12 volts. There we go. Okay. So we've got a, a pretty reasonable halogen bulb in circuit on this unit. You can see the bulb flashing away. And on the screen, on the actual oscilloscope, we've got now essentially a digital wave. We've got a voltage supply, which is the peaks at the top. And then we've got zero volts down the bottom. And it's basically the bulb is either on or off. There's no in between. It's not like the linear scale was before where it would slowly increase and slowly decrease. If we increase the voltage you can see the uh, the graph increases. This is the voltage scale down here and it steps up slightly. But it doesn't seem to affect the actual frequency, the number of times that bulb flashes per second doesn't seem to make any difference at all. Let's turn that bit down a bit, it's a bit bright. There we go, okay. Reduces the noise the unit's making because the, the armature's hitting the, the contacts a bit harder, but other than that, there's no real change in frequency. Now, if we, with these old school relays, if we change the load on the relay, i.e. The, the wattage of the bulb, or bulbs in the case of a car, then we will see a change in frequency. So we'll just do that. We'll turn the power down. And uh, you may recognize this is an old bulb that came off that Yamaha Viking off the tail light. So we're going to rig that up instead of the, the halogen bulb. And we'll see how that affects the frequency. Tell you what, we'll choose the right wire first of all. Uh, that relay buzzing is because the the park light filament is only five watts, and that's insufficient for the actual relay to operate. It can't it can't control its armature with such a small load. It needs a higher wattage to work. So black is earth. We'll leave that one alone. Blue is obviously the um, the park, and of course yellow will be the the brake light filament, which is 21 watts. Okay, so we're all rigged up now with the, the low wattage bulb. This is a 21 watt. 
whereas the halogen one I think is 55 watts. So, you know, less than half. If we turn the power up now, we should get the relay to activate again. There we go. And we're sat on just over, well, about 12 volts there. And you'll see now that the frequency, the number of times that bulb flashes per second, is much, much faster. Now, if we slow down, uh, sorry, if we, if we actually speed up the, um, the sampling uh, and change the scale on the screen, so we're going to time and we reduce that down to say half a second once it refreshes you can now see that the each actuation is much clearer on the screen so we can go down to 200 milliseconds 100 milliseconds and then we really start to get some very fine detail of what's going on um, whilst the unit is in the on position you can see there look that the, the actual voltage it climbs very slightly from when the bulb first, the filaments first energized to when it's actually turned off. Again, 50 milliseconds. Now we're starting to, to exceed the size of the graph. We can move this trigger point here, and I'll explain that to you shortly with the trigger point. But if we exit out of there and then go on to trigger. Hang on, exit out there. If we just go onto there, onto the main menu, and then just click across, that will move the position of the trigger on the scale, actually on the graph itself. Um, what we've lost the ability of here, though, is to see more than one actuation. We've really, all we've got there is one lighting of the bulb across there. So we can't see the, the one before it. We've got nothing to compare it to, which makes it a little bit difficult. So... If we were checking, for example, the output of a wheel speed sensor for an ABS system um, or the actuations of um, oh, an ignition system, you know, the, 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 the ignition coil, this the primary winding on the coil, um, or, for example, the actuation of a fuel injector, then really we, we want to see two or three at least on the screen, if, if not more, so we can compare one to another. Certainly, on a, for example, a wheel speed sensor, if there's a little defect on, on the turn ring, Say one of the little ridges has got damaged, and there's say 25 or 30 ridges on that turn ring. Realistically, we want to see all of them on the screen so that we can see which one is faulty, and it's going to tell us straight away that the turn ring's damaged. So let's scale back out again, change the time. So back onto deviation, time, and then we need to increase that back up, say half a second. Give it a second to work out. Okay, now with the trigger, that's the little T on the screen down here. If we go onto the trigger mode, T mode, here look. So press trig and then press T mode. We've now got a few options on here. Now, if we put it onto uh, trigger mode auto, instead of, it's currently on normal. If we put it on auto, so we press set and then exit. Then when we see it come on the screen, there we go. Oh, okay, it's picked up on it this time. It's actually uh, maintained the same viewing as we got before. Sometimes when it's on auto, it just it, everything moves around on the screen. It's very difficult to see what's going on. Whereas if you put it on manual, then you can decide exactly where to have the, the positioning of that T. At the moment, it's right down the bottom. So the trigger is the point where the voltage first gets to zero. And we can change that, we can move that up. Uh, if we go on to uh, T mode again, put it back into uh, normal or manual, set that, exit. Wait for us to get some readings on the screen, there we go. And then we can move. Here we go. Give us a screen. Hmm, okay. We could earlier on what's changed. Let's change the slope. So at the moment it's it's when it goes down the slope, this is when it's going to go up the slope. So we'll change it onto there. Set, exit. 
and you'll find now the positioning of the T on the graph has now moved and it's going to be triggered. There we go. Look, it's now it's now been triggered. The trigger point is when the voltage first gets to the maximum point, which is somewhere around about 12 volts. Okay, seems to see it flicking up there. It doesn't actually give us a very good read. That's what you would see on your voltmeter. Is is that voltage on the screen there flicking around all over the place? The voltmeter can't take samples fast enough to give us any kind of pattern. Whereas on the screen we can see that. And the trigger point now is uh, as soon as the voltage gets to its maximum, the start point is that top left-hand corner. So extremely useful. But what we what we're seeing here is a device really that's that's triggering still quite slowly. I mean, if you could imagine um, an injector on a car on an engine that's running at say 3,000 RPM, that injector is going to be operating on and off much much faster than this, a lot faster. Um, and even a voltmeter is at the moment is struggling. In fact, let's rig up a voltmeter and you can see what a voltmeter will be showing us. Okay, so we'll move that across. We'll chuck a voltmeter in the in the whole mix. Okay, so stick that on there. And let's find the earth again. Where's the earth wire gone? Dun, dun, dun. Oh, that is the earth now. Okay, so I'll have the earth wire on there. And positive, here we go. Now, some of you may be wondering why I've got a pot on my hand. Yeah, that was a whole new story. Okay, so what we've got here, we've got what you would see on a, volt, uh, a voltmeter, a multimeter, and the benefits of what we're seeing on the oscilloscope. And when you compare the two, there's no comparison. On here, we're just seeing voltages jumping around all over the place. There's no real pattern to it. If you look on the screen of the oscilloscope, We've got some really fine detail information going on on that screen. It's telling us the pattern. It's allowing us to compare what we've got on there. What one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, almost nine actuations of that bulb on one screen. So you know, if if it was every sixth actuation there was something faulty, we would see one of these peaks would have an irregularity. The voltage might be lower. It might be at an angle. It may spike a lot higher. It may not operate, it may actually miss a flash, which will be the case of a turn ring. Um, if one of, the, uh, one of the little lumps on the turn ring, one of the teeth on the turn ring had become damaged or got chipped off, for example, then we'd, we'd see a gap. Um, the same goes for a crank angle sensor output. With a crank angle sensor, the ECU needs to know um, a particular position in the angular rotation of the crank. And again, they normally use a turn ring, but with one tooth missing. So the, the, the point of reference is the missing tooth for the ECU. And we would see that um, very clearly on this screen. Okay, so what's next? Well, we've, we've sort of covered how to operate the unit to some extent. We can, uh, a few more bits and pieces we can do before we move on to the vehicle is we can change the voltage. Now, to do that, again, we exit out of there, we press uh, deviation, or division, here look, division, which is the uh, the voltages and the time. So remember we pressed division before to change the time, which was H, but now we can also change the voltage for A. Now A is the input signal we're looking at here. These uh, oscilloscopes have got the ability to have two separate inputs and we can create a graph with two lines. Um, now to change A, we just press uh, F1, and then we can move up to 10 volts, which means that that will then shrink down. There you go. Okay, so we've lost a bit of our fine detail, but it would mean that if we increase the voltage right up, then we're not gonna go off the scale. So you can see the increase there looking voltage on the, on the screen right now. Don't wanna hold it at 15, those relays are not really meant for that. Um, we can also bring that voltage down as well. We could bring it down to two volts. Now, chances are that's going to flick off the top of the screen. There we go. If I bring that voltage down as low as I can, it might just... Well, we can see the T there, look. So it may just bring it down enough. Let's see if we can get, get low enough on there. Ooh. 
you can see the voltmeter now, it's it's just showing a constant voltage pretty much. Yeah, it's all over the place again. Doesn't know what's going on. Can't cope with it. Okay, so the relay is now uh, given up. It's not actuating. The bulb's gone out. So essentially, uh, the supply to the bulb will be zero, and we should flatline on the screen any second now when it resamples, of course. Hopefully. Okay, maybe not. Okay, I think we have to exit out of there to get that. There we go. Okay. Um, so I've shown you how to change the voltage. We'll just go back to um, back to the five volts. That gives us five volts um, per uh, square on here. Uh, Ten volts would be per square. Now, don't forget, most cars, uh, all sensors um, get a supply, or most sensors get a supply signal of five volts, unless of course they're self um, self generating. Um, like a, an O2 sensor or something, so we've got 5 volts, so we don't need to go any higher than that. If it was an actuator that we were looking at, actuators get 12 volts, so we'd need to maybe change the scale down um, to, uh, you know, maybe 10 volts. But, you know, 5 volts is enough, because if each, each of those blocks is 5 volts and 3 blocks is 15 volts, that's still fine. Okay, uh, B essentially does exactly the same thing, that's just for the other input. We don't have that set up on this unit at the moment, so we can ignore that. And of course, H, H uh, division is for your time, and we're on half a second um, sampling at the moment. So each, again, each of these squares here relates to half a second. So two squares, one second. So we can actually see the frequency going on here. If we have a look at that, we've got, once it samples enough, there you go, we've got essentially two actuations per half second um, so we've got four per second which means we're running about around about four hertz if that was the indicator on your car here in New Zealand that would be a warrant fail we're only allowed to have actuations of two uh, up to between one and two hertz for your indicators okay so we finished essentially um, showing you how to use the unit they're actually really simple um, depending on what you're testing will depend on what scales you're going to be using. Um, if I increase that time uh, right up to like, you know, five seconds and run the unit, then you can see that really, yes, it's creating a graph for us. Is it useful information? Not really. It's too, it's too blurry. Okay. So let's move on to the vehicle. We're going to test a few different things on the car using the oscilloscope, and then by that time you should have a good idea how to operate one of these things. Okay, so, so far, and I'm trying to do this reasonably quickly for you, and I'm sure there'll be lots and lots of bits and pieces I need to edit out. But we've seen um, the comparisons between, uh, or the limitations of a voltmeter in comparison to all the extra information we get when we use an oscilloscope uh, to measure the same signal output. With an oscilloscope we see history, we see um, a, a much broader image with a lot more accuracy, and we can see very slight changes in signal output uh, and, and defects. You know, we, if we can see a pattern there, and one of the, one of the actual um, parts of the signal doesn't quite look like it should do, um, that could flag a fault code on your ECU, or at least cause the car to do something uh, that you're not expecting it to do. Maybe the engine's not idling correctly, or it has a surge, or it has a flat spot, or whatever it is. Okay, so I think the next step now is to get uh, a vehicle. I think we'll use that little RAV4, because given my hand, I have not been able to do the engine job on it yet. So we'll get that dragged up, and uh, we'll, we'll test things like O2 sensor, uh, we'll test... Um, injector on the screen. Um, we may even be able to get around to checking um, the ignition, the primary circuit on the ignition, although I'm not sure if we can do it on that vehicle. We do have an old uh, ute, an old Ford ute, so we may be able to, uh, to get a signal from that a bit easier. Um, sometimes you can't always see every single signal, uh, just by the design of the vehicle it makes it very difficult. Okay, so let's go and find a vehicle. Okay, so on this little RAV4, what I've done is I've taken a pickup from the ignition coil and obviously a negative off the battery. And what we've got there is the ignition signal. Each of those pulses is a collapse 
of the primary uh, coil, the primary winding on the ignition coil, which then induces a current into the secondary winding. And we can, we can see that happening in real time. That's on one millisecond uh, divisions for time. And we can actually hold that whenever we want. I'm pressing the button. Now, what I'm gonna do, make it a bit easier for you, is I'm gonna extend the wires through, take this into the workshop, and then we can play around a little bit with the settings and see if we can improve uh, the picture that we can see, the graph that we can see that represents what's actually happening on that ignition system. So as you can see, I've connected the car. We've got the, the positive lead going to uh, the pickup on the coil. Now on the primary circuit, there's usually two wires. One is a permanent live and the other is a switched earth. And you need the switched earth side otherwise you won't get a reading you'll just get constant battery voltage and of course the other end needs to go to uh, a ground somewhere to give us um, a change in voltage to read okay so i'm going to disconnect the oscilloscope run an extension lead through into the workshop and then we can play around in there where it's a bit quieter okay so hopefully you can see this pretty well um, you can see on the particular screen we've now got the, uh, the pattern that the, the primary circuit on the ignition coil gives us. And we can play around with some of the settings. And, and realistically, it, it's, uh, the more you use one of these, the more familiar you get with um, what settings work best for what kind of signals. Now, we can change the, uh, the division on A. We can go up to 50 volts or on 20 volts at the moment. And if we go up to that, then that's going to slow the whole thing down. But we, we lose a lot of the detail. So if we go back down again, it's jumping around quite a bit. I want to try and move the trigger points so that we can stabilize this section here. We can see the resonance uh, of induced voltage that goes back into the primary circuit as the secondary collapses. Or as it collapses, should I say. As the primary collapses, it itself induces voltage. So... If we go into trigger, and I just want to move that down, there you go, look, you see, by moving the trigger point, we can stabilize certain sections of the actual. And then we can actually zoom in on that. So if we go, in, if we change the deviation, or the division, sorry, on H, we've now, we can now see very clearly that part of the cycle where the coil is collapsing and it's actually inducing current back into itself. As that magnetic field collapses, we're getting an induction, an induced voltage. And then of course it collapses again and it induces again. And, and that's a very common feature. It's, it's what you always see with an ignition coil is, is that sort of bounce effect at the end. If we want to scale the whole thing down and try and see the whole picture, then we need to change the time as well. So if we go down to there, then we're going to start to see uh, we need to increase the voltage again. Let's go up to 20 volts. Okay, so it's really it's really dumbed down the whole graph for us now. And we can see here we've got um, 12 volts coming in, or battery voltage coming in. Uh, and then the, uh, the current is, is um, the, the circuit's broken. And then the, the magnetic field is generated as that, uh, the collapse. Um, so as the collapse of the magnetic field occurs, we get induced voltage. So realistically, um, the scale we've got here really doesn't tell us a lot. Sure, we can see that the ignition coil is firing, the primary circuit's working, but it doesn't really give us a lot of characteristics. So we need to zoom in on that. And a 10 millisecond um, sample time just isn't sufficient. So if we change that, go on to H, speed it up, we can start now to see some real-time stuff going on. You can see just how accurate these things are getting. If we want to see the whole peak, we're going to need to increase the voltage on A. In actual fact, oh, we can just about get it on there. That's at 100 volts. But the, the quality of the graph, the overall quality, is much reduced. So really, it's not that helpful to us. It's something of that resolution. So I'll bring that voltage back down again. 
Now, if we go out, we can actually move the position of the whole thing on the graph. Just by going across. Okay, so that's just one of the many things that we can actually uh, we can test and get an idea of what's happening. It gives us a lot more information about what's actually going on with a particular component. Okay, so I've just plumbed up the oscilloscope to number one cylinder's injector. And without disturbing the wiring too much, because we'll do a bit of this in the, uh, in the workshop again, we now have a display. Put the light on for you. A display showing the uh, actuation of that particular injector. And if I, if I give it a rev, if I can, you will see that injector duration change. See how it stays open for longer? The open period is the line along the bottom. Okay, this, this middle line here. And we'll talk about that more when we get into the workshops with the meter. But essentially, when we rev, rev the engine up, we need to increase the amount of fuel going into the engine and essentially the, the opening duration for that injection, the period of time that it's spraying for, the on period, uh, is uh, increased. So we get more fuel spraying into the cylinder. And you can see that's, that's a pretty regular looking injector pattern there. Look, it's all working just fine. So I'll, I'll uh, connect the extension lead and we'll get this put in the workshop and we'll talk more about this and we'll play around with some of the settings as well. Okay, so the, the, the period of time that the injector is closed and spraying fuel is that bottom line down there. And as you saw, when I revved the engine up, that line extended, which meant that the opening period of time that the injector was spraying fuel also increased. Now, if we reduce the, uh, the divisions again, so we go on to division A and we make that uh, 10, then we get more detail, but we lose the peak up there, look. And the same goes with five. You know, we can, we can essentially sort of zoom in, so to speak, with that. Um, about 20 is going to give us the full screen. Uh, and again, if we want to see more than one actuation, then if we go on to the time and we uh, decrease the time, then we're going to start, hopefully, to see... There we go, look, there's another actuation there. So now we've got three. The refresh rate is pretty slow on this one, unfortunately. But you can now see we've got three actuations of that one injector. So we'd usually have it on about this setting here to see exactly what's going on with that injector. And if I was outside and give it a rev, you're gonna see that line increase. And again, we can use the we can use the hold function to to capture a particular image of what's going on. So really useful, and more more modern ones now. You can actually store this to video, and you can actually upload the videos to your PC. So um, extremely useful, and to try and capture anything like this using uh, a standard, you know, voltmeter like this. Um, it, it's a no hope, it, it's way out of its depth on this kind of stuff. Sure, um, we may be able to, yeah, on that one there we've got, as you can see here, we've got uh, a duty cycle button or, for, or option, and that would tell us uh, what percentage of time the injector is open compared to what percentage of time it's closed. And obviously as we rev the engine, we're going to need more fuel, so the opening duration, that percentage will increase. Uh, so we'd see an increase in what we call duty cycle, which is an on or off um, signal. Okay, well I hope that's given you a little insight into why we use oscilloscopes uh, for testing output signals um, from sensors and other signals going to actuators uh, on modern cars for their EFI and their ignition systems. Uh, and it's, it's really down to the fact that a voltmeter just, it's way out of its depth, it can't react quick enough uh, to those signals, it can't display them very well, we can't interpret them very well. Whereas um, using an oscilloscope gives us a full graph, it gives us a full 
real-time picture of exactly what's going on with that particular signal. Now, my apologies for not showing you the O2 sensor. I was really looking forward to doing that for you. Uh, unfortunately, it turns out that the O2 sensor on the RAV4 doesn't. No, it doesn't sense oxygen anymore. It just doesn't give a signal out. Um, it's dead. So that's another thing that's going to need to be replaced when I do the engine. Uh, might account for the fact why it uses so much petrol. Yes, no doubt. Uh, the engine's going to be sat uh, on basically uh, using uh, a predetermined uh, fueling map as opposed to actually reacting to what's going on within the combustion chamber. Anyway, that's a whole different video, I'm sure. Um, so yes, using the oscilloscope, really, really helpful. And I think without a particular um, specialized code reader for that particular vehicle, pretty essential actually in um, checking various sensors and so on. My name is Andy Young. I'm one of the lecturers down at Unitech in Auckland. If you have any questions or comments on this video, please leave them at the bottom of the screen and I'll do my very best to get back to you. Thanks for watching. Cheers.